Welcome to the Time for a Reset podcast, where we interview senior marketers on the big issues of the day and how they're dealing with those challenges in an ever-changing landscape. We deep dive into the latest trends, strategies and tactics that will help you stay ahead of the curve and stand out in a crowded marketplace. This episode is hosted by me, Nick King, Global Practices Lead at CVE. Let's get into it. Welcome to Ola Diachuk, who is the data-driven media director at Heineken, where she leads a team of planning, buying data and technology experts who work to engage and deliver cohesive experiences for Heineken's consumers. On top of this, Ollie's passion is to ensure that her brand's media is sustainable, diverse, and inclusive. And she's been there and done it with some of the biggest brands in the world, having risen to managing partner at OMD, where she led on brands such as McDonald's and Bacardi. In her spare time, somehow she managed to fit in being a mentor at South Bank University, supporting tomorrow's talent. Great to have you on, Olia. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. We always start with the question, if you were to hit reset on anything in digital marketing, what would it be? We'd love to hear your views on that. It's a great question. Kind of timely, I suppose. Um, I think despite the fact that I work in media and technically we love separating media from creativity in this industry, I would actually hit the reset button on creativity for simple reason. I feel like Often nowadays, it's downgraded to us as production and competition between media and creative, ATL, BTL, traditional and digital. And I feel we are losing the focus while doing that and become really operational in what we do. And it's clearly seen in the work in the fact that the creativity is basically delivering its lowest effectiveness in the last, I think, 24 years according to the work that John Haggerty has done. And I've done his course in the business of creativity recently. Absolutely, like, so much respect to him. And it's simple things that we need to bring back. Storytelling, exciting people, engaging people, and creating memorable experiences. And I think this is what we all could do better, is basically being marketeers who think about creativity However, take it to the next level and use all the exciting, powerful tools we have, the data, the tech, to make creativity even better. And I think that's what we could do all together, media, creative, marketers. All. I, th- I think that's such a, a powerful call to action for the industry. Yeah, I th- you see those top 10 lists of you know, best ads, yeah. and they all seem to be from about five to 10 years ago. Yeah. And you know, if you had to, from somebody outside the industry, you'd be hard pushed to remember one for the last couple of years. Yeah, but also the creativity drives business growth as well. Yeah, so more creative companies drive higher return to their shareholders. And I think someone like, I think McKinsey proved that. So, well, it delivers. Yeah, I think that's an undeniable fact. That's a great place to start. You've worked with some really great brands in your career. You moved from agency side to client side. What attracted you to Heineken in the first place? I would say that when you are working on the agency side, you have a luxury of moving between businesses, which gives you a great opportunity to understand various cultures, ways of working, people. But what that means is you can move between cultures. Yeah. Mm. And what was important for me when I was looking for my next challenge, A, obviously shift to the client side and opportunity. I think transparently to be exposed more to the business and actually deliver real business outcomes and feel like I can work beyond media, which I do right now. But also the fact that I want to work for the business that I share the values with. And Heineken is that type of business because you live in one culture. You can't change it. And I've done so much due diligence and talking to people about Heineken and I've not heard even one negative point. People love working with Heineken. People love working with Heineken people. The brands are amazing. The culture is great. And it's just been getting better and better. And honestly, I love the business. I think it's great business globally and locally. And we have amazingly open-minded positive, dedicated, passionate people everywhere from marketing to supply chain. Oh, it's super inspiring. I think that the culture of a company is, is so vital, something that sometimes gets left behind, particularly in these slightly straightened yeah. financial times. Indeed. 
We talk a lot about the fact that we want to elevate marketing to the board level, that it's not just a, a cost function. What, what's the one thing that you're doing to sort of elevate marketing to the boardroom at Heineken? I think that the one thing I keep working on is proving effectiveness. The only thing that can truly, truly <laughs> catch attention of a CFO, CEO, or anyone at the board level is an outcome. So I've been listening, I think, to gazillions of podcasts in the last few months dedicated exactly to, partially to that, yeah, and how to create the right language, how to prove effectiveness. And to me, it's the key, yeah, it's how I can talk about, I love ROAS, I love ROI and brand power metrics, and those are the key for us, and those are part of our KPIs when it comes to marketing. But there are business KPIs, yeah. And every company, I'm sure, have a KPI around revenue, profit margins, share of market, value share, volume share, etc. That's the language that I would like to bring more of into what we do, but also try to find ways to measure the outcome to enable me to speak that language. And I think that's not an easy path for someone like us because we don't own point of sale in most yeah. of the cases. We do own pub business, but even within this pub business, like most of it is listed tenanted. So we actually rent it out to people. And hence why we can't have an access to our point of sale fully. So we have to rely on third party to provide us with the sales data for on and off trade. So for retailers and the pub and restaurants, which slows things down and doesn't help with attribution. However, I think we've been quite good internally with improving our marketing mix modeling and trying to get closer to the revenue that we deliver and the actual brand power we deliver. And then also the last couple of years of improving our e-commerce, of starting really and accelerating e-commerce, really helped us to open doors and talk about the revenue that we bring and report on it really quickly. When we work with likes of Tesco, yeah, or Ricardo, someone talk about indeed ROI, but also talk about share of shell and the value share that we deliver online shop versus offline. Those things truly make a change. I think the measurement challenge is a massive one for the whole industry. But I actually think quite often that businesses such as yours that in the FMCG world are actually so far advanced because they haven't been able to track things. So they're not obsessed with cookie-based tracking. Yeah, and we know it's, uh, it's an advantage and, and the curse a little bit, isn't it? So we have to be creative indeed. But still, we are not, can't be as good as some of the digital first businesses in truly understanding, for example, the consumer journey. Yeah, we are doing it and we are trying to do it through brand health funnels. Uh, but we are not an online business that mm -hmm. can use a variety of tech to understand your online behavior, quickly track where people are, optimize the journey, and create, let's say, more transactions more often and do better cross-sell, upsell. And that's something that I would like to do more of. And, well, working through the data and working with our partners. Fascinating stuff. I wanted to sort of dig into a little bit about, I talked a little bit at the beginning about one of your passions is, is sustainability and responsible media. What's Heineken doing in that space? Yeah, it was a big part of the WFA conference recently, and I'd love to sort of see what you guys are doing. Yeah, I'll be honest. I think before I moved to Heineken, the responsible media topic beyond, I suppose, the diversity and inclusion was really part of the agenda in the media world. So I think the move to Heineken changed it for me. And then somehow just coming in and just start hearing about the Brew Better World, which is our strategy for being a responsible business. And that incorporates the sustainability aspect, the basically diversity, equity, inclusion, but also responsible consumption. It kind of yeah, made me think because you hear a lot about supply chain in supply chain, because of what we do, we're trying to use less water in supply chain. Our cider is trying to be fully sustainable. We are trying to use less electricity and use it basically more sustainable. But then I was like, well, what's media? I mean, what are we doing? Are we mm -hmm. doing like much? And this is where I think we had a great opportunity with my team to lead on it 
and yeah. being in marketing, like there's people who come with ideas around sustainable media and responsible media and basically inspire our brand teams and BTL teams and others who are extremely open-minded, positive and brilliant to do more of it. But also because we have an excuse of having brilliant brands in our portfolio mm. that are reflective of e like either DNI or sustainability agenda because you can't be everything. Like You have to have it true to your brand DNA or true to your business. Like our yeah. corporate strategy is true to us. Everybody in the business knows about it, feels it, and it's a part of what we do. Uh, same with the brand. So we have brilliant inch cider that I mentioned, which is made 100% of British Apple, sustainable brand. This is how we position. It's in our DNA. And Inches was the first brand to test almost everything we do in sustainable media, from creating out-of-home sites with clear channel that basically clean the air and then we use this site to turn into tote bags that we gave away to actually then the running this year the first carbon neutral digital campaign that we launched in-house work in progress it's running we see amazing results so far but this is inches that you can feel it and we want awards for it because it's, that's what we do but then we also deliver the business we are growing yeah. category through this brand and then we have Old Mood, which is supporting WWF, different angle. And then we have brands like Heineken and Stronger, which are more around inclusivity. And we have great opportunity with Heineken last year and Women's Euros to actually bring that inclusivity angle and with a campaign cheers to all fans and supporting sport, like women's sports. Yeah. And again, it was translated into media. It was translated into type of partners we worked with, which was like a lot of female talent, a lot of people, abilities, talent, great, absolutely great influencers, absolutely central to what we did. And then Strongbow this year, who has been as well, basically supporting British culture for a while. But this year we are, hopefully we're going to take it to the next level with Heineken as a business supporting Pride working with Purple Goat as a consultant to help us to do it in the right way as well. Mm. And again, taking it to media, yeah, because we work with Pink News and we plan to work with other partners. And it's just an ongoing process of aligning to our brands and making sure that we are testing and learning basically for this areas. Sorry, it's a long-winded answer, but it's a lot. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. I love to hear what you're doing. I love that support of women's sport. Uh, I've been to some of the Red Roses matches and some of the the women's zeros. It's kind of the fact that brands are getting behind them. It's that sort of virtuous circle that means yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the number of people are going and, and it's great for brands and and every, everybody wins, really. Do you have any sort of hard defined goals? You talked about that sort of testing framework. Is there anything that, that yeah. you said that we have to hit X by Y? That's a good question. So when it comes to both elements, we try to put some guidelines and KPIs. So those are hard KPIs for my team. We started with a simpler one, which is investment with those partners, with sustainable and DNI partners. So that was our last year target. Partially we take it into this year because we'd like to take it to the next level. Well, we are trying to add though and this is where it goes back to measurement so because sustainability is not something that we can consistently measure as an industry and mm. we are a part of ISPA so we are part of sustainability group there again highlighting the same challenges working with that net zero that we need to standardize measurement process standardize the calculators to actually being able to understand how much we produce how can we reduce it so while this is happening, we've been collaborating with our agency, Dentsu. And again, it's so important to have right partners. Dentsu has been so aligned to our culture when it comes to both DNI and sustainability that we are the first to be the tester for their carbon calculator. And pretty much we're working with them to well, help them to improve the product. So we used it as a starting point to measure how much carbon we produce. We're trying to reach... The metric, because you can't just measure it in number. You put more investment, yeah. you change media mix, and suddenly your number goes up or number goes down. So you can massage it any way you want. Well, I want something more specific. 
And I know that's really like feels quite challenged because of that. But who does not a challenge? Yeah. So we are trying to arrive to metric of CO2 per like GRP or a okay. thousand impressions. And basically we are literally having a meeting in the next few weeks to understand how this is going to shape our annual KPI because the ambition is to say we would like to increase the CO2 by X percent from our campaigns. So yeah, we'll see how that's going to pan out. But meanwhile, investment with those partners is important as a metric. And we're also trying to expand it into production by bringing our creative agencies, uh, social influencer agencies, and basically encouraging them as well to utilize our industry calculator for uh, production, which is the, basically the tool that they have open to everybody. So hopefully this is going to help us a little bit as well in the tracking. But I was actually going to ask you, what can other businesses do? And so I'm assuming that you'd you'd like everybody to adopt your calculator. Is there anything else that you'd recommend that yeah, businesses should adopt uh, from a sustainability point of view? So the calculator is called Ed Green, just so that people know. It's basically, it's valuable there than for the businesses in the UK. When it comes to adopting things, I think mindset is a starting point. Adopting a mindset of responsible marketing, being a growth driver is important because it is a growth driver. Yeah. So we know that people are ready to, consumers, I think, are ready to spend more on sustainable products. I think one of the American companies did the research. I absolutely love Lydia Moa, who is, she runs the Black Pound Report. I think she claims that there is like 4.5 billion of disposable income amongst those multi-ethnic communities. So it's a growth source, yeah? So start with that and then approach it in, like you do in anything. Test and learn is a starting point. Testing, learning, getting best practices, and then turning things into business as usual. That's what we did. Year one was about testing, learning with the brands that are most willing, easy to adapt. Then year two, we turn some of those things into business as usual. So year three now, we are integrating it into our commercial planning and annual planning. And we have a very simple processes and checkpoints to make sure we integrate sustainability, DNI, responsible consumption into our process. And we have a checklist, very boring checklist that we give to everybody say, guys, as you move throughout your process, please make sure that you check those things that, for instance, you think about what is the role of sustainability for your brand? What is the role of DIY for your brand? Then did you make sure that you explore the production in the UK before you move somewhere else? What about people who work behind camera and in front of camera? Did you think about diverse talent? So all of these things just help with the reinforcement of their mindset as well. So yeah, simple stuff. We do it all the time. Just learn, make the business as usual, keep learning and keep taking people on the journey. Amazing. And I guess, yeah, the question with all of this is, does it have positive business outcomes? But from the way you're talking, because you've got all these checkpoints, it has to lead to profitability, I'm guessing. Yeah, I can't really say the profitability, how that comes in. But I would say that example of each is a good one. We're not going to say that, oh, this out-of-home site drove to the fact that we have acquired new category, like new drinkers inside the category. However, the fact that all the activities we did were coming on the back of brand positioning, which is true to the brand, it gets translated into your media choices, into your creative, and that delivers amazing brand power. Like in the year three, we've got absolutely incredible brand power results and we have good business results and on top of it it's a good fun we won some awards lovely we also yeah. like that <laughs> so that, that's what you see and with heineken i think heineken is a good example last year with women's euros campaign we also some really good brand results on the back of it because you are relevant because you do the right thing for the society i hope we will be able to track all of it better moving forward. But um, there are those simple success stories that 
prove the point. Yeah. So diving a little bit back as well into sort of that data-driven media director to role, I'd love to sort of dig into a bit that as sort of the, the we all know that the industry has become more data and tech led. You've obviously got it in your job title. How does it sort of change the operating model that you have within Heineken? So it's to some extent a bit similar to the, the first very first question about creativity. I think data and technology should be empowering people and simplifying things mm. for people. Like most of the businesses, we will be always on a journey to improve our processes by using technology and data. So we are doing it in our buying, in the simple terms. Sorry, we'll probably start with planning because it's, it's uh, going through the process. We absolutely use data and tech to inform our planning and to we use a CCS planner with then so that is incorporating all sorts of questions, aspects, panel data, all the way down to DNI aspects as well. Yeah, to help us to create high quality audiences. We are now integrating more and more of retailer data into our planning. So bringing together better brand and conversion, which is often for FMCG brands, I think is a challenge because although we absolutely 100% agree with Byron Sharp that we have to drive reach is important, there is absolutely room to make sure we scoop that demand better as well. So bringing together retail and a broad brand through data at the start of the process and throughout really helps. We use data and tech for buying more and more. And I think the platforms like Meta, like Trade Desk, like Google, they all are using AI nowadays. They all are using automation. So we've been adapting those tools for buying nonstop. So for my team, it's an ongoing learning process. And obviously, we've been using it for a few years, of course, dynamic creative optimization and tools for DCO. We've been doing it for our product campaigns. We've been doing it for our brand campaigns like Euros in 2021, variety of weather-related campaigns. It's, it's a basics for us now. And then when it comes to, I think, measurement, of course, that also comes to life. And we're trying to use more and more of automated ways to measure outcomes. I'd say this is the longest one for us to go again because we just don't all point to sales. So a lot of it becomes quite manual process for the business. So that's, I think, well, where broadly we are. In terms of would this change operating model broadly, like if you take a level up from media into marketing, it won't. Mm. I just don't, I can't really see how our commercial planning is going to change because we have data and tech. What should happen is to become more effective and efficient. So we spend less time collecting the data for our identifying jobs to be done and more time discussing those jobs to be done and making informed decisions. That's the thing what we all are trying to achieve. And what's interesting there is AI. I bet the next question would be about AI. <laughs> I love the fact that you said that AI is just part of what you do because Google, Meta, Trade Desk have all been using it. I sometimes think we're trying to say that it's, it's completely radical. We've been talking about it for five years, but yeah. But I would like to sort of see, is that something that you're trying to yeah. think about and incorporate? Or are you just going... I'm already using it. This is just part of my standard operating process. Yeah, I think this is it. I mean, we are not the tech company to produce our own AI fancy tools yet. So what we do is we try to use what we've got. And mm. I have a team of social buyers, programmatic buyers, and they work in the trade desk and they work in Meta and they work in Pinterest. And they go in and they have automated budget optimization, automated creative optimization, this and that. Got gazillions of other stuff that they have as well that I'm not even aware of. But what's interesting, I think, is more the fact that there is a lot that is happening in the AI space in other parts of the business. And that's what's great, like mm. supply chain, our uh, technology department, thing, data science. That's where I think we could do more and more and more. And it's exciting to see what the business is going to do with it because Heineken is the business who is really putting a lot of attention into kind of data technology right now especially but what worries people i think is the fact that ai is going to come in and take over 
our jobs. And in my view, as you said, AI has been here. We've not been using it because it is not at the heart of our product. Our product is beer and cider. That's what we sell. Yeah. However, AI is going to change how we think, like the skills that we've got. So for my team, I and for the creative agencies that we've got, the media agencies that we've got, what I would like to see more of is people being asking the right questions to AI because AI is as good as the questions you ask. So for me, I think we should acquire, and myself as well, more skills of asking the right questions to extract the value from AI and potentially just exactly be a bit more creative, be more strategic because AI gives you a great platform, but then it's up to you to take it and basically work with it. And I think that's what the skills that are going to be important is creativity, ability to ask questions, strategic view, and empathy. Something AI can't do, like empathy and the human touch. Mm. I think I, that's so spot on. I love the fact you're embracing it whilst also having a healthy challenge that is not solving all problems. And also, I think that questioning piece is so true. If you just ask it, a really broad question, you get a load of rubbish out. Did you hear that, sorry to interrupt you, one of the universities, I can't remember which one, actually now introduced the whole degree of working with generative AI and asking the right questions, like it's a part of it. I was shocked. I was like, this is a proper response to what's happening in the world. Yeah, no, it's, it's learning to ask good questions is, uh, yeah, arguably should be a uh, a skill that we have anyway. You know, you, we've all been in interviews where the interviewer has turned you off because you're a bit like, well, those aren't good questions because you're not finding yeah. stuff out about me. But it, it's the same thing. You can you can either find out a lot or, or not find out much. And I can uh, almost not ask this question just because it's such big news. And this is being recorded on just after the Apple announcement last night of the Vision the new AR glasses and things, is that something that you go, we've got to find out loads? Or is that going, that's just part of, it will be an interesting piece that we have to think about in a bit of time? Yeah, I'd say it's about balancing acts. Yeah, we all love a new shiny thing. Mm. And don't get me wrong, if I get to test it, I'll test it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Is it going to change my business tomorrow? I doubt it. In my personal opinion is that we should do what we need to do well, like make sure our foundations are nailed. Yeah, we do media well, we do creative well, we do genuine speaking marketing well, and keep an eye on what's coming up and like anything, any new technology, and basically test it where we can. Yeah. But be honest, this is not going to change the world. Like we talked about metaverse quite a bit, don't we? And lots of brands are trying to do something there. And they've been doing great jobs. I mean, look at like sort of like Balenciaga, for example. Yeah. Great example. However, I doubt that this might represent the majority of the revenue and this will help with uh, delivering like to shareholders. It might in a few years when it's properly scaled and becomes mm. a part of our daily life. And the question for any business is how much time and money can you invest based on where your business is into those new shiny things. But it's worth keeping an eye on those because, again, it's a bit of inspiration and open-mindedness and just, just a very, very good ambitions to have. Yeah, so interesting. So just want to wrap things up. You're obviously a mentor at South Bank University. What's the one piece of advice that you give to sort of marketers and, and young professionals starting out in their career? Don't give them advice until they ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that should be replicated across the industry. <laughs> yeah, I think actually two things. One, I know we talked about responsibilities a lot, a lot here, like TNI, sustainability, all of it. One thing we often forget is just think about people. Mm. Because we work in people industry. And when you mean think about people, think about your team, think about consumers. As boring as it sounds, we all say, we put consumer in the heart. God, I mean, how many times I've heard this phrase? I like, do we? Mm. Do we? Are we putting our brands first? Are we putting our consumers first? Where's the answer? And I think it's important to remember that. It's like, always ask. Yeah, I mean, 
what's first and how you make sure that people go first. Obviously, because people are at the heart of delivering growth anyway. Yeah, because without your colleagues, without your team, without your consumers, you're not going to grow. And second is stay excited. I mean, look at our industry, Nick. We discussed gazillions of things. We could spend hours here talking about everything that happened in the last three months. Yeah, and it's just hard not to be excited. It's an exciting industry. It's fun. It's moving, changing, challenging. And there is always something to explore. That's why I love it. Like every day I learn something new. So to me, love your people, think about them, and just be excited about what you do. And then you're a lucky person that does what they love and hopefully build a really good career. Awesome. I hope anybody, any grads that I interview have spoken to you first because they'll pass with flying colors. I love people who just come with passion and yeah. thinking about others. I think that's so true. Yeah. Passion for, we, again, I think we are very privileged people who love what they do. Mm. And it is privilege and luck to do what you love and get paid for it. And having such a fun job. Our jobs are fun, genuinely, yeah. compared to quite a lot of others. Very true. Olya, it's been absolutely brilliant talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Same here, Nick. Thanks for inviting us and great questions. I love, love your like reset questions and last one. Yeah, really nice. Great. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Time for a Reset. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back talking to another senior marketer very soon. Make sure to leave a review and catch you next time.